Now we're going to talk about the true experiment. A true experiment is the only known technique for demonstrating causation. That is, if you want to say something caused something else, you probably have to do a true experiment. An experiment requires a set of procedures, otherwise no causal statement can be directly made. And we're going to look at those exact set of procedures. The experiment is the most powerful technique for gaining psychological knowledge. Much of what we know today is due to running excellent experiments. The experiment is designed to test hypotheses such as does caffeine improve test performance? And now we're going to look at some of the requirements for a true experiment. Now I'm going to talk about a random assignment. Random assignment of subjects, also called participants, to groups is absolutely required. An experiment requires a minimum of two groups, one called the experimental group, the other a control or comparison group. Random assignment means that a participant has an equal chance of ending up in any group. There are many methods for random assignment, including flipping a coin, pulling names from a hat, or using some sophisticated computer program. It's important to remember that random assignment means that groups are randomly equivalent. That is, no known systematic differences exist in the groups. I now want to talk about something called the independent variable, which we shorten to IV. Sometimes the independent variable is called the treatment variable. The independent variable must treat at least two groups differently. For example, in a two-group experiment, the experimental group gets a different treatment than the control group. We can call that treatment A versus treatment B. The two groups are then tested and compared on an outcome measure to see if the different treatments actually made a difference in the group averages. I now want to talk about the dependent variable, which we shorten to dv. Sometimes it's called the outcome variable, or possibly outcome measure. Following the application of the independent variable, experimental and control groups are measured with the same technique, and their means, or average score, are compared. This difference in means is then subjected to a statistical test, such as a t-test, to see if the difference between the experimental and control group is statistically significant. That is, the resulting difference is highly unlikely to have occurred just by chance. If statistical significance is found, we say the differential treatment caused the difference in the dependent variable or outcome measure. One of the most important ideas in experiments is the idea of the operational definition. Specifically defining both the independent variable and the dependent variable by a set of operations is important and crucial to the advancement of science. For example, if you want to know if caffeine improves test performance, caffeine, the independent variable, has to be defined specifically operationally. For example, 80 milligrams in a 10 ounce cup. Likewise, the dependent variable, performance in this case, also has to be operationally defined. For example, percent correct on this particular 50 question test. Without such specific definitions, other scientists could not duplicate your experiment or run a variation on it, so-called replications. We have some other important concerns when doing a true experiment. Uh, one of the most important ideas is the, the idea of experimental control. Your goal is to make the experience of the experimental group and control group exactly alike, except for the independent variable. I also want to talk about a very important procedure called the double-blind procedure. Participants, or subjects if you will, are blind to, that is, they don't know, which procedure 
they are getting, experimental or control. The experimenter doesn't know which group a subject was in when measuring the results. Both conditions are needed in a true double-blind procedure. The experiment may have more than one control group, and these may be called comparison groups. In medical experiments, the control group is often called the placebo group, that is, they get to take a pill that has no effect whatsoever. Let's try to pull all these ideas together with an example experiment. Let's start with a hypothesis. Does caffeine improve test performance? Let's pretend that some 80 participants are randomly assigned to one of two groups. Group A gets 80 milligrams of caffeine in a 10 ounce cup of coffee one hour before the exam. We're going to call them the experimental group. The control group Group B drinks decaffeinated coffee one hour before the exam. Neither group knows what kind of coffee they are drinking, so they are blind to which treatment they got. Both groups are given a 50-question exam on algebra. That's the operational definition of the dependent variable. The person or persons who grade the exam do not know which group a participant was in, so they are also blind to the conditions. We find that the caffeine group gets an average of 81% versus an average of 72% for the no caffeine group. In this experiment, we have to ask the question, is a mean difference score of 81 versus 72 meaningful? The answer is, it depends. Depends on how spread out the scores are. The more spread out the scores are, and the greater overlap the scores are, the less meaningful the difference is. Of course, the reverse is true. If the scores overlap very little, and they are tightly bunched around 81, for group A and around 72 for group B, then the difference would be more meaningful. We need to use a decision-making model or a test of statistical significance, such as the t-test, to decide if the difference is real or just a chance event. And we'll take up statistical decision-making in a later lecture.